Hey everyone, thanks for joining us um, for our KubeCon session. If we're marketers and if we can learn distributed systems, so can you. My name is Betty Janad. I am Senior Director of Multi-Cloud Solutions at VMware and I'm here with my buddy, Paul Burt. Hi, I work at HashiCorp and I'm a Senior PMM there working on open source stuff. Awesome. So we are super excited to talk to you about something that's near and dear to our hearts. Um, first off, uh, the slides and the reading list, we've got an extensive reading list at the end of this, um, can be found at this link, and we will make these slides available from to uh, CNCF so you all can download it. So first, let's start with why. Um, we're all here because we're interested in Kubernetes, but have we thought about why? Why do we want, why do we want Kubernetes? Because everyone else does. It's, there's FOMO, everyone's using it. Um, but we really wanted to start with the question of why. Um, why do we want Kubernetes? Um, we really are thinking why it's, it's why behind why we want distributed systems. And really distributed systems are all about failure. So fundamentally accepting that systems will fail, your applications will fail, your server will fail, your network will fail, anything can fail at any given time. And it's not that it, it, there's, it's someone's at fault for that, uh, but it's a specific uh, mindset um, that applies to your design. So uh, if you accept that failure is inevitable in any layer of the stack, um, then what you do is you will design your systems to fundamentally handle that failure. And handling that means two things not only building your system so that it is more resistant to failure so that you can prevent it, but also knowing that planning for when failures happen across the environment, how to handle that gracefully. So what will you optimize for in the event of a failure? So failure is inevitable and we know this because we used to live in a world where we deployed thing, a single app to a single server. And we're like, this is great, now it's running. But we all knew that if that thing went down, the whole thing failed. Right, you can't get to the app anymore. So what do we do? What do we do? We said we need more servers. So great, we went from one to three to five or whatever. Now we have a cluster of servers, and so we have some fault tolerance built in, um, so that if one of them fails, we can route the traffic to another one. We can write some rules to route the traffic to another machine. And this is not a new problem. It's not something that started, you know, just recently with, um, you know, in the recent years because of Kubernetes. It's actually a problem that we've been trying to solve for a very long time. Started way back in 1969 with ARPANET. Um, this was a military project, military and academic project, thinking about um, can we build a, a decentralized system so that if a headquarters location was um, uh, suffered a catastrophic failure for whatever reason, can the systems and command center still be online because we've distributed that information out? So this is the first uh, first sketch of the ARPANET uh, when it was launched in 1969. You can see that there are four locations and these were distributed across um, different states, different cities and having those um, environments connected to each other through dedicated phone lines. The first ever, one of the earliest uh, systems whiteboards. <laughs> and what happens is when you start to distribute systems, when you start to scale out, um, even just in the cluster. And then you start to think about distributing those um, systems across different geographic locations. You start ask, you start having to answer a whole lot of new questions, right? Um, as you distribute systems, you need to understand how will these systems know what is the correct plan? What was the idea intent um, for that system? How should it behave? Uh, what should be running? And then how will those systems talk to each other um, so that they know what's going on? You know, is everything behaving the way it should? And when it finds out that something isn't, what is it, what are the instructions? What are it's, what is it supposed to do to get it back to the desired state? Uh, a simple example here is for those of you who've ever played the game of telephone, you know, as a child, you've got like you and your 10 friends lined up in a row. The first person sends up, whispers a little message into the second person's ear. And you know, by the time it gets to the other end, it is nothing like what you first said. So distributed systems is in many ways trying to solve that problem. But that's not necessarily an easy problem to solve. So distributed systems are hard. And Paul, can you go into like why it's so hard? Definitely, thanks for asking. Uh, so we'll talk about some theory up front. Uh, CAP theorem is the big one that you need to know about. It's classic choose two of three. Uh, and in this case, we're choosing between consistency, availability, and tolerance of network partitions. 
Uh, that last one is something turns out is really hard to avoid in the modern internet. So uh, essentially we're choosing between consistency and availability or a CP system or an AP system. We'll take a look at what consistency and availability are uh, in a second here with some examples. Uh, suffice to say most modern systems and what we'll really be looking at in detail with Raft uh, use a leader and follower topology and then they have to find consensus or figure out availability in the face of a failure uh, based on that topology. Uh, they also have mechanisms baked in uh, to achieve quorum in case maybe a leader fails. Uh, if you can still communicate with a majority of the cluster, in this case, two out of three nodes, um, you can still have consensus and return responses. So we'll look at elections and how all that stuff works in a bit too. So first up is availability. Availability means we always return our response, even if there's a failure. Uh, and in this case, uh, that means that the data might be slightly out of date or it might be out of sync. That server that got disconnected can still uh, return responses if it needs to. Uh, just means uh, our data is a little bit stale. And this isn't a big deal for things like likes or uh, anything along those lines. So uh, it's a great way to go if you need an AP system. Think about that for social media, that sort of stuff. On the flip side, if we're dealing with money or shopping carts, we kind of have to have the correct data. So uh, what we really want is a CP system in that case. And Kubernetes, uh, as we'll learn, is based on Raft, which uh, generally gives you a CP system. So we want consistency between all of the nodes to ensure that we're returning the correct data. Um, Eric Brewer is the person who kind of came up with Cap Theorem originally. And he's noted uh, recently in a follow-up to that, that uh, he thinks we can do more interesting things with consistency and availability, using them in uh, sort of contextual um, moments to provide a faster or a better service because trying to achieve consistency can slow us down. Um, and there are some really interesting theorems and protocols that follow that, like Tapir and PackElk. Uh, but we'll leave those as things in the notes for you to discover, sort of an exercise best left to the reader. Uh, and we'll just talk about Cap Theorem as it relates to Raft, which is what most modern distributed systems are based on, uh, which we'll learn. But before we dive into that, let's talk about what consistency is, uh, specifically because database consistency is a bit different than distributed systems consistency. So with database consistency, what you're really looking forward to is all the rules of the database are followed. So the schema, the constraints that you've placed on stuff, all of that gets followed when a transaction gets committed. Whereas distributed systems consistency, what you're looking for is a majority of the nodes in your cluster are in agreement when it comes to returning a response. So you're checking that there's agreement uh, on the data that you're returning to make sure that it's correct. Another issue is availability. Uh, high availability is slightly different than uh, some of the other availability that's discussed. So uh, there's a great IBM paper that talks about high availability in the abstract and high availability for some people uh, might be just having a good battery system connected and a regular backup schedule. Uh, whereas high availability can also extend at a larger scale to using multiple clouds or multiple regions. Um, the scale that you wanna go to with high availability kinda depends on you. Um, and distributed systems availability means when there is a partition or an issue with the system, um, you're still gonna give a response even though your data might be slightly stale or slightly out of date. So uh, one thing to note about Cap Theorem is it's sort of a boundary. It sort of makes us take the problem seriously that we can't just do everything, uh, which was an issue when we first started de designing distributed systems. Um, but it doesn't necessarily help us build distributed systems. Uh, thankfully, there are things that help us build distributed systems. So yeah, uh, do you, you want to talk about Raft, Betty? Well, actually, you mentioned a lot about uh, Raft. And the big question is like, WTF is it? You know, yeah. um, it seems like a lot of systems are based on it. Um, and so, you know, uh, I know you did a lot of preparation on this. So I will let you, uh, I will tee you up for that. All right. Thank you. Um, so Raft, uh, whoops, I think, let's see if we can go back a slide. Yeah, so Raft's goal is to be a more understandable Paxos. Uh, and that's just Paul, because- Paul, what yeah, is Paxos? <laughs> that's a good question. We should cover that. Uh, so Paxos is a formal system that was uh, built to help design distributed systems. So it's been proven with a language like TLA+. Um, that it's a correct system. Uh, and 
the issue with Paxos is it's really hard to understand. So uh, in getting his paper reviewed, Diego Angara, the creator of Raft, um, you know, got comments about how just ridiculously hard Paxos was. So in addition to correctness and performance, one of the goals of Raft is to be a subset of Paxos that is also understandable. So we'll cover that in a second here. Um, one thing to note with all this is that as our size of our cluster grows when we're building a cluster that's based on Raft, um, it gets a little bit slower because the networking gets more complicated. We have to talk to each of the nodes and try and get a majority rule on things before we deliver a response from the leader. That happens for reads, writes, uh, election results, everything is sort of a majority rule. And uh, as an example, uh, let's talk about how writes happen. Uh, and you can kind of work out how reads happen as a result of this, but uh, the leader will get a write request. It will stage the write in the replicated log. The replicated log is sort of the shared data state um, that's linearizable, so we can replicate it deterministically. The leader will then send a message out saying, hey, uh, majority of the systems, I'd like you to stage this on your log. And they'll give the leader a response once it hears back from a majority of the systems. Uh, it will then say, okay, great. Everybody go ahead and stage that commit uh, or commit that. Uh, and then that is committed to the log and that is the state of truth at this point. When a read request comes in after this, uh, the leader just has to check with the majority to make sure that it is indeed agreeing with that majority. And as part of this, uh, the heartbeat message goes out to each of the followers when it's taking some of these actions like a, an append entry, or it'll just go out naturally uh, as a heartbeat message itself. Uh, and the heartbeat message basically tells the system or the followers in the system that they're still connected to the leader and everything is good. Uh, if they stop receiving the heartbeat, then they know something has happened to the leader, either a network partition or the leader has crashed. Uh, and in that case, uh, on you know, 100 millisecond or 300 millisecond sort of random interval, uh, the candidate uh, or one of the followers will promote itself to a candidate and then vote for itself and then ask other followers to vote for it as well. Um, other followers may also promote themselves to candidacy uh, and vote for themselves, but uh, each member of the system is only able to vote once. So eventually, uh, one of these systems will uh, be validated as getting a majority of the votes and be elected to a leader. And each time this occurs, uh, a term number is incremented. And that term sort of helps the system recover from a failure or know which log is the most up-to-date uh, in case the cluster is restored or networking sort of comes back online. Uh, the creator of It's Raft, very democratic. It's a very democratic yes, system. Uh, it is. For these servers. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> and, also, and it's kind of like, a, it's, it kind of flips that game of telephone on its head where it's always one person sending that message, right? Sure. Yeah. And to your point earlier about how do we communicate or how do we know what's correct? A lot of it is just um, talking to the other people in the chain and uh, making sure that they agree with you rather than, just passing the message along without doing that sort of checking. Um, so this gets very complicated uh, relatively quickly. Um, and the creator of Raft has some great talks out there. There are a lot of other talks about Raft, but uh, we have links to this um, with more detail on the actual specification that you can check out. So, um, Paul, you know, this, this sounds amazing because, you know, what we're trying to do, like we say, we're trying to solve for, um, you know, designing for failure. Right. And with um, and this is important for bigger and bigger systems. Right. Because you can't manually touch everything. You know, you'd probably be getting um, as an operator like a gazillion um, pings a day. And so a lot of this is around having the system do that checking autonomously and adjusting for these things at a time. But sometimes with all that kind of automation built in, it can be problematic if something is off. So. Definitely. Can you, I know you've got a great um, example here for us to talk through on like, you know, when you can have like a real world cascading failure because, yeah. of, the, because of all the automation. Let's take a look. So Target uh, thankfully shared an example. Thank you to all of the companies that share their failure stories. That's just how we learn. This place is so complex. Um, mm -hmm. They had a upgrade to their Kafka cluster, which did messaging and uh, collected logs for all the various systems. They had sort of a heterogeneous network. Um, and that caused intermittent uh, network issues where the Kafka system sort of slowed down during that upgrade. Uh, as a result, uh, all of the Kubernetes systems uh, that had logging sidecars determined that 
uh, they were having issues and their all of their pods and everything needed to be rescheduled because things became unhealthy and it triggered a thundering herd. Uh, so everything this, just, yeah, spinning up at the same time and just hitting the system, right? Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the gist of a thundering herd. So it's uh, an event comes in, everything wakes up at once. And because it's all automated, um, it's all pushing forward at once. It's trying to do good things, but because it's all synchronized at the exact same time, uh, it really hits the system like a, a tsunami wave in a way. Um, everything just starts toppling down like domino dominoes. So in this case, um, I think Target said over 41,000 nodes were spun up really quickly and added to their service discovery uh, before everything sort of calmed down. Uh, so this can get really big and really nasty very quickly. Uh, it's just one of the fun things you sort of get to deal with when you're working with distributed systems. So uh, that's sort of the theory. Uh, do you want to talk about some modern implementations, Betty? Yeah, so in this, um, we'll go through kind of four different examples of distributed systems and how they approach things differently. And I think one thing that's really important for us as a community to understand is that um, I, we hear a lot of X versus Y, you know, which is better. And really, um, we are only here at this point because of some of the work that has happened over the decades. And so um, it's not really an X versus Y. Um, there are generational aspects related to the technologies um, for distributed systems, um, as well as in many cases, different ones are better for, are better for different types of workloads or personas. So this is an interesting um, area to dive into. So. You know, back, let's go back to our timeline a little bit. We had ARPANET, we're talking 1969, um, way back when. Um, the next kind of sets of um, innovations that impact what we're doing with distributed systems are in the 80s and 90s. First is the um, x86 uh, CPU standards um, that actually brings forward um, this era of more commodity based hardware, um, which then leads to uh, mass virtualization. So introducing, um, you know, a broadly accessible uh, abstraction layer from uh, from physical compute. Um, with uh, modern virtualization in the late 90s. And then uh, ARPANET coincidentally ended in 1989. And that is also the same time the first IFP ISPs offered internet access. So make of that what you will. But those two things are pretty foundational to the next era, which is the 2000s. And what's interesting here is we have had more innovation within the distributed system space in the last 20 years than in the previous like you know decades. And that's really a confluence of a number of things. Um, uh, we have, you know, we have like mass um, adoption of the internet since the late eighties. Um, with that came the birth of web scale companies. So companies that fundamentally delivered experience over the internet, right? So uh, web apps, um, you see like the, the likes of Google, Facebook, Twitter, Netflix were all kind of founded in the late nineties to the two thousands. And so um, and that's only possible with the internet and broad-based connectivity for everyone. So you had that infrastructure, that global infrastructure plumbing there. Um, the availability of commodity hardware and uh, concepts like virtualization. So people were able to buy lots of, um, lots of servers um, running big data centers. And from that, they needed to solve problems of how do I make, um, how do I you know, make better use of my individual um, hardware resources. Cloud computing. Um, once people started to move to like using things in the cloud that then further abstracted this concept. Um, and then the last bits are containers and open source. Um, there is a clear line in orchestration systems in a pre and post container era. Um, and because what containers did is actually kind of change it from being just a hardware level thing that you needed to fix um, and a data center, um, a data center kind of pooling to now like I'm doing some stuff in cloud, I'm doing some stuff on prem. And also now I've um, blown up my construct. So I now have, um, diff I've made my distributed systems, we're distributing the systems itself. So we're distributing the little application components across them. So we've added more layers. We've diced up uh, the stack even more. So let's first start with Mesos. Uh, Mesos started out in um, 2009 um, uh, out of Berkeley. And really what they were looking at is how do we turn um, a bunch of data centers, data center orchestration. So how do I cluster a bunch of systems in the data center to make it look like one giant, effectively one giant server. Like I could have like a 10,000 servers underneath, but it looks like one server. So then I can't um, schedule 
a workload on top of that and be able to pull, you know, just pull from a pool of resources. So that workload may be using uh, compute and memory from, you know, three or four machines, right? So um, it's almost like the reverse of virtualization. Uh, one of their premises was to kind of um, uh, eliminate the concept of VMs and it, instead just look at it as um, isolation of resources that can be assigned to a workload. So what are Meso's strengths with scale? Um, you know, it was run in production at Twitter um, for a long time. It is can scale to like tens of thousands of machines to then um, present itself like as one uh, machine um, for the operator. Um, and another strength that was brought up was modularity. So that um, things like, um, of all these things were pluggable um, and things like frameworks and such could be, um, uh, developed independently of the core um, architecture. And it was very popular for very like, uh, for workloads like Kafka, Hadoop, um, those ones listed below, which is also, which is um, specifically like what uh, Twitter used um, this for. And there's lots of uh, blog posts and such on how they use that and um, for all their data processing because they're so memory intensive. Um, an interesting thing about Mesos is that um, just this year, earlier this year, it almost went to the attic which is kind of Apache's way of um, ending a life cycle on a product, um, but it was, um, it, it didn't make it. And so it's still there. It is still running in production at a lot of places, um, but it's not something that um, we see a lot of today um, uh, because some of the, the shifts over to Kubernetes. However, still very popular for certain workloads. So how are apps represented um, in Mesos? Um, apps are represented as frameworks. A framework is something that um, people can um, develop. Um, it can be schedulers. Um, it can be for certain types of workloads, et cetera. Um, it actually includes two bits. One is a scheduler. And this is really what talks to the, uh, the master to understand how much resource needs to be applied to this thing. Um, and then it also includes an executor, which is really the task itself. Um, and, and later on, so Mesos started before containers and later on added support. So the task, so the, the task itself can be run in containers now. Um, and with the advent of Kubernetes and the concept of pods, um, they've also added support for something called task groups so that you can have a collection of containers um, as part of this. And how do the apps communicate? Um, what's interesting here with Mesos is they drew a clear line and what that um, while data while networking is very important in the data center, a large part of that is um, out of the scope of what Mesos will actually orchestrate. And so instead what they've done is made the networking pluggable and integrate two existing network solutions. So as an example, uh, Mesos supports um, two container runtimes, the Mesos container and Docker containers. And so with that, they actually support the CNI spec as well as um, a Docker container networking spec. And so with that, they um, allow to create, um, you know, en enable IP for containers. You can create a network and then attach the containers to them. And Swarm. So next we'll talk about Swarm. And full disclosure, I worked at Docker for about five years. So I um, was there through, for the history of Swarm. And in fact, I joined the company right after the first, um, first generation of Swarm was introduced in 2014. And so like, what is, um, what is Swarm? It's the way to cluster Docker engines and Swarm actually had two lives. Um, first, we now, the original Swarm is now called Classic Swarm. And then around 2016, there was something introduced called Swarm Mode. In the first generation of Swarm, it was um, yeah, simple clustering. Um, networking had some ability to like um, uh, link containers to each other. Um, it was directly um, done in compose files, which is the which is how you um, uh, write an application. Um, and Swarm's focus was really around um, the ease of use, the ease of use and simplicity. Not from the perspective of like lacking, uh, you know, we're not going to build a bunch, we weren't going to build a bunch of features, but from the perspective of like building for the developer, right? It was very much a developer experience. Um, let's have simple commands um, in the CLI to do these things at a multi multi uh, node level, connecting multi container level, and the idea of have the simplicity for having fewer components. Um, even as the migration happened to the next generation of Swarm mode, it was the idea that you didn't need all of these other bits in order to make a clustered environment. So Swarm mode has a lot of similar kind of uh, constructs as does uh, Kubernetes constructs, but what they did is actually built that all into the Docker engine. So 
as you instantiate new nodes, um, turning one of those into a, a manager node or a worker node is single command. Things like joining and leaving clusters, single commands, also with a lot of built-in defaults. So upon instantiating it as a clustered node, things like PKI, um, other security certs and tokens were all kind of automatically handled by the Swarm itself. So really focusing on that, um, uh, you know, the ease of the experience. And how are applications um, represented? Well, in the Docker construct, there's something called a compose file. It's a YAML. And there's also a compose version one and compose version two. Um, and because as um, applications and the use of containers got more interesting and, uh, and more complicated, as people started using more of those um, technologies, um, compose v2 also took those things into account. Um, and so that it defines the, the, the containers, how they should be instantiated, what, um, you know, uh, what images are going to be um, built from the services and the environment, how they should be scheduled and how they should be networked are all part of that, um, are part of that file. Um, the definition of services is a little bit different in, in uh, Compose as it is in uh, Kubernetes. And I know a lot of Kubernetes developers love Compose still and use it, just translate it to Kubernetes. Yeah, it's been super popular. Um, I just um, I just saw on uh, Twitter today that uh, one of my... Uh, Someone I know, they're now actually receiving um, applications from their software vendors as Compose files. So it's great. Mm -hmm. It's a very simple way to define things and you can kind of define all of these things in an order. Um, and with that, you know, specifically like networking, right? Once you start having um, multi-container applications, they fundamentally need to talk to each other, right? So in, um, in the Docker construct of Swarm mode, they, there's, you know, Swarm, classic Swarm and Swarm mode. Um, and classic Swarm, you did things like uh, links and you would actually define in the file, like I'm gonna link container A to container B. Um, with Swarm mode, actually, there was a number of default network drivers that were provided. So things like uh, you can do bridge networking, um, host, uh, you know, host networking, where it's kind of you don't need any isolation. Everything on the host can talk to each other over the network so that containers across um, a number of different hosts can talk to each other, as well as uh, Mac VLAN, which is something that's also popular uh, in Kubernetes. Um, so they shipped with those network drivers, allowing um, the operator to kind of set up whatever they wanted. Um, you can instantiate the network and then attach your containers to them um, or, or define them in the compose file, as well as use a number of network plugins. And this is where you could um, plug in um, various network uh, solutions from the ecosystem. Um, and with that, Paul, since you work at HashiCorp, you want to go into Nomad? <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. So uh, HashiCorp runs Nomad uh, or builds Nomad primarily. Uh, and Nomad has a lot of strengths similar to some of the other stuff we've talked about. Uh, one big strength that I think differentiates it is it's really easy to plug into an existing PaaS platform. Um, that's because it's very simple and flexible, um, has a lot fewer moving parts than most of these other systems. Um, it's also a bit more flexible in what it manages or what it schedules. So it can run a bunch of different types of processes in addition to containers uh, and multi-cluster and federation are already a feature. So uh, it's fun to play around with if you like experimenting with that stuff. Um, similar to what you mentioned with uh, Docker, Betty, uh, a job file kind of contains everything that you would expect to see in a deployment and a service. It's sort of a monolithic file, uh, similarly based on a HashiCorp configuration language, which is sort of a close cousin of YAML. Um, it's just slightly more uh, readable and friendly, uh, borrow some ideas from Toml and that sort of thing. Um, and then as far as apps communicating with each other, uh, Nomad prefers to keep things pluggable so you can run it with console doing service discovery and service mesh type stuff for you. Uh, or you can just run it bare uh, by itself, in which case it shares the host network uh, for any of the applications that are running on top of it. And then you're free to kind of customize it however you like. Uh, should we cover K3S next? Yeah. Cool. So this is sort of like Kubernetes little brother. Uh, K3S is uh, smaller, lighter, and uh, it's a single binary. Um, it's sort of a batteries included solution. So it's similar to other distributions of Kubernetes where all the tools that you kind of need to make it work um, are there packaged with it uh, as it's installed. So it contains Helm for instance. Uh, and it's unique in that most of these systems that we've talked about operate on Raft or some Raft like system um, so far. Uh, this runs on top of a traditional uh, relational database instead of etcd. It can also run on etcd, but 
Um, you know, that comes with trade-offs of, in the case of a failure, um, things may not quite be as correct as they would be in a system designed with Raft and XCD. Uh, but it's a nice trade-off if you want to do something like have a managed Postgres service from the cloud, uh, manage your, your kind of state management layer, which is what XCD generally does for Kubernetes. So K3S is great because you get the same Kubernetes ecosystem because it's just a slimmed down version of Kubernetes. Uh, and same deal, you also kind of network things together in a very similar way. Uh, I think they include their own load balancer as an add-on, um, which is nice, but uh, for the most part, it's basically Kubernetes under the cover. Uh, so we should probably talk about Kubernetes since we've yeah. been doing all this. <laughs> uh, so yeah, let's, let's dive in. Um, so you may be aware of pods and Kubernetes and the control plane, um, all of those components, but uh, really, where etcd and the raft component lives within Kubernetes uh, is in the control plane. It's a set of nodes that etcd gets deployed on. Um, and the control plane may include other components like core DNS, the API server, controller manager, a proxy, a scheduler, which helps place uh, workloads that come in. Um, and this is all just sort of uh, what runs the stuff that uh, your kubectl connects to when you're trying to deploy something. Um, it makes the decisions, it does reconciliation for you. This is kind of the brains of Kubernetes. Uh, and what all these things do is they push their state down to etcd for the most part. So etcd is sort of the most complicated or the most frustrating part of the distributed system for a lot of people. Um, it's the source of truth, right, Paul? That's, yeah, exactly. That's, you nailed it. Um, and then when we look at one of the worker nodes that's connected to Kubernetes where the actual apps get deployed to, um, you know, there are things like Kube Proxy and Kubelet, which receive communication from the control plane and send communication back. They actually execute the commands that they receive. Um, and then we need something to run containers. So Container D is running there as well. And uh, you can probably explain Container D better than I can. Uh, so what's yeah. Container D, Betty? Yeah, so Container D, when you look at um, Docker, it's, it, it's, and you have the Docker engine, Container D was the component of that as the core container runtime. And what we had done um, years ago at Docker is take that part and then actually donate it into the CNCF and make it part of the community so that everyone um, in the ecosystem can leverage that for the core runtime aspects of containers. Awesome. Yeah, so now it's part of Kubernetes. Um, similarly, etcd is part of Kubernetes. And like we said, uh, etcd is where a lot of state gets pushed to. So if you're really looking to learn distributed systems and want to learn more, start learning about the failure modes of etcd. As Betty said earlier, failure is sort of the key of distributed systems. Uh, and we have a lot of great content that helps teach that in the notes of this presentation. And speaking of failures, uh, I think you can help us understand the Byzantine fault tolerance or the Byzantine generals problem. Yes, and so this is an interesting one. And so a great way to, uh, great kind of a human example of this is you're out with, your, with a group of friends one night and one of your friends trips and falls and they're obviously bleeding. And you say, hey, are you, hey buddy, are you all right? And they're like, I'm totally fine. You can obviously see that there's a problem, but that person has decided to tell you that they're fine. So, uh, and then the rest of your friends, you're trying to figure out what to do. So in the example of distributed systems is that, you know, you're sending traffic and you're sending data and the system is not returning a response or behaving like it should, um, but all the health checks turn out fine. Um, so it's kind of like this mismatch in um, the desire, what you know the state should be, but it's not behaving that way. But then the rest of you can't figure out what to do yet. Yeah, and that's a problem for Raft. Raft saves us from a lot of problems, but uh, most protocols can't save us from all problems. So there's always going to be stuff like this that uh, kind of lurks in the shadows and will bite you when you're working on distributed systems. Uh, kind of closing things off, I really like this example from Kent C. Dodds. He's got a, a master's degree in management information systems. And when you're evaluating any of this type of technology, it's incredibly complex and incredibly difficult and sort of the beauty of working in the open and doing things collaboratively through open source and with a community is we all get to kind of share this burden together and learn from each other. So, you know, we learned from the target example earlier because they were great, gracious enough to share with us. Um, there's a lot of other great examples you can learn from if you get involved with the community. 
Yeah, we've got this really long um, uh, reading list for you with all the, with links to everything that we've mentioned in the talk, as well as other things. Um, there's also, um, you know, there's vendored options where they handle some of these other, uh, managing some of those other bits for you so that you can get some of the experience, um, but then not have to handle all of the lifecycle stuff with it. Definitely. And then there's things like fully hosted options in the cloud where you can play with um, actually deploying, the focusing on the application side, and maybe not have to worry about managing all of the, um, the internals.